we all have an intuitive idea about what a symmetry transformation is. What Weinberg himself says is pretty nice. He says that a symmetry transformation is nothing but a change of one's point of view, but with the additional demand that this change is not going to cause any alteration in the result of experiments. So, if you have an observer O, who sees different states of the physical system as represented by the rays, say R, R1, R2, and so on, another observer O prime would describe the same physical states by different rays, maybe R prime, R1 prime, R2 prime, and so on. In other words, a state which is represented by Rn, the ray, according to O, will be represented by the ray Rn prime according to O prime. Now, the one thing that you can physically calculate or one physical result that you can get out of these rays is the probability that if the system is in ray R, what is the chance of finding it in ray Rn, which as we just saw, is nothing but you take a vector from R, you take a vector from Rn, form the inner product, take the mod square. So this probability R to Rn is the essential physically observable quantity that you can get out of this description. Now when O tries to calculate this quantity, he or she uses R and Rn as the respective rays and calculates the probability using that. O prime, of course, will describe the same states using rays R prime and Rn prime and will, cal will calculate P of R prime to Rn prime. The demand that this is a symmetry transformation says that these two probabilities, or rather these infinitely many probabilities, one for each orthogonal ray Ri, these have to be equal no matter which observer observes them. So this is the basic demand that you have. So how exactly are these rays R, R1, R2, Rn, etc. for O and R prime, R1 prime, R2 prime, Rn prime, etc. for O prime related to each other? Now since we are actually working in a Hilbert space, a vector space, it would be nice if we could talk about the relationships between the vectors themselves, the vectors which make up the rays. And this is what Wigner proved in the early 1930s. His famous symmetry theorem, where what he established was that for any such transformation which takes R to R prime, here note that we are not really talking about transition or detecting a system in a state R prime when it's in R. R and R prime are descriptions of via rays of the same state by two different observers. And the transformation here is more of a mathematical transformation between one ray and the other. Well, let's go back to Wigner's theorem. What Wigner actually proved was that we may define, and this is important, for any such transformation from which carries R to R prime, we may define an operator U, which of course acts on the Hilbert space itself, it's a map from V to V, such that If psi belongs to R, then u psi, the result of applying the operator u on psi, belongs to R prime. So you can actually implement this transformation by an operator u. And this operator u has two possibilities. It's either unitary and linear. So, 
you acting on zeta phi plus eta psi is zeta, once again zeta and eta are complex numbers, u phi plus eta u psi, that's linearity for you, and unitary, which means the inner product of u phi and u psi is the same as the inner product between phi and psi. The other possible option is or anti-unitary and anti-linear. So what anti-linear means is the following. U acting on a linear combination, eta phi plus eta psi, does not yield the corresponding linear combination, but rather yields zeta star, where star is you know, conjugation, u phi plus eta star u psi. So basically, for an antilinear operator, the scalar coefficients or the complex number coefficients comes out, but as conjugates. And anti-unitarity it's very similar to unitarity except for the fact that u psi and u phi inner product is actually the same as phi psi inner product or if you take the psi and phi in the same order, you have a conjugation. Weinberg actually gives a rather detailed proof of Wigner's theorem. In fact, he claims that he has even corrected a few steps which Wigner had omitted. We are not going to discuss this right now. Perhaps in a later video I will talk about Weinberg's version of Wigner's proof of his famous theorem. Before we go any further, let me take a quick look at the notion of the adjoint of an operator that we introduced just a while back. For an operator L, the adjoint is essentially defined in the following manner. You take the inner product of L acting on phi with psi, the result is the same as the inner product of phi with some other operator acting on psi and this other operator is what you call L dagger. Note that this expression that we have is antilinear in the first factor phi on the right hand side. On the left hand side as well, if you replace phi by a linear combination, L phi would become the corresponding linear combination. But because this is the first factor in the inner product, when you open it out, you are going to get complex conjugates of the coefficients outside. So both sides are antilinear and phi, so everything works out fine. However, if the operator L, instead of being linear, had been antilinear, then things would have gone wrong because the right hand side would still be antilinear in phi. After all, it is antilinear in the first factor. That's what an inner product is. But the left hand side, well, if L were an antilinear operator and if you were to replace phi by a linear combination, L phi would have the complex conjugates brought out by the action of the antilinear operator itself. But then when you take the result from the inner product's property, you're going to end up with a linear combination. Okay, let me just uh, write this out a bit. Suppose instead of L, you had A, an antilinear operator, and you replaced xi phi by z1 phi1 plus z2 phi2, and try taking the inner product with shan. Now, because A is antilinear, you would get zeta 1 star A phi 1 plus zeta 2 star A phi 2 as an action of the antilinear operator. And now when you are going to take the inner product, because of the basic property of the inner product, you will end up with zeta 1 times A phi 1 comma shy plus zeta 2 times a phi 2 comma psi. Now this would be inconsistent with 
the right hand side because the right hand side would be antilinear in phi anyway. So in order that this becomes consistent for an antilinear operator what you need to do is define the adjoint operator slightly differently. The adjoint operator would have to be defined in this manner. A phi linear product with psi will be a dagger psi's inner product with phi. Note the difference. Here a dagger has moved onto psi as before, but the thing two have switched sides. So it's phi comma a dagger psi's conjugate. So this is how you have to define adjoints for antilinear operators. But now For linear operators, you had u phi u psi is phi comma psi, that's the linear unitarity. But that in the language of adjoint becomes phi u dagger u psi is phi comma psi, and since this works for all phi and psi, this implies u dagger u is identity. This is for the linear case. For the antilinear case, antilinear anti unitary case, you again have u phi u psi. But this time is psi comma phi. But the definition of the adjoint being different now means the u dagger suppose u dagger were to move from here to here but you will get u dagger u phi comma psi's conjugate. That's the way you define a u dagger for the Antilinear operator and that has to be equal to psi comma phi which is phi comma psi is conjugate. Once again you see that even for the antilinear case u dagger u has to be identity. So if you consistently define the adjoint of a linear operator or an antilinear operator, in both cases our symmetry operation has to have the property that u dagger the adjoint of u has to be its inverse. So that is unitarity for a linear operator and unitarity for an antilinear operator. Okay, so Wigner's theorem tells us that a symmetry transformation can be implemented by either an unitary or a uni anti unitary operator. So the question that we have now is. Under what circumstances is the operator unitary or when is it anti-unitary? Now the question can be answered in general, but what we are going to do is take a look at a few specific situations where we will see whether the situation tells us what kind of operator we are going to deal with. Now one symmetry operation which is there in every system is nothing but the identity which is doing nothing. Now the identity is obviously represented by the identity operator which is unitary linear. So that's not a very big surprise. However, many of our other common kind of symmetry transformations, things like rotations, Lorentz boosts, or Lorentz transformations in general, translations, these depend continuously on some parameter or the other. For rotations, for example, the parameters could be the angle of rotation as well as other parameters which tell you which axis you are rotating about. Lorentz transformations would also have parametrizations which we will discuss in some detail later. Translations, exactly how much are you translating, that's a parameter. Now in these particular examples, by continuously changing the parameters, you can make the transformation smaller and smaller until they exactly coincide with the identity. So 
basically these transformations are all connected continuously to the identity and this implies that such transformations have to be implemented by unitary operators after all you start with the identity operator which is unitary and as you keep on tuning the parameters you don't expect the, the continuously changing operator suddenly becoming anti-unitary so in all such situations you are going to have unitary transformations discrete symmetry transformations can be represented sometimes by anti-unitary operators but as we will see this is usually the case only when there is a reversal of time involved in the symmetry operation. The time reversal symmetry, the typical mathematical apparatus for that involves anti-unitary operators and that is about it. In all other symmetry transformations, we actually deal with unitary operators. Now one important point that comes into mind in regard to these continuously connected to the identity operators is the following. You can think of such a transformation as being infinitesimally close to the identity. So we can think of a small parameter epsilon which tells you how much the transformation de deviates from the identity and then for such situations the operator has to be unitary as we said and we can easily figure out what its form is going to be. If epsilon were exactly zero, we would be at the identity transformation. So then the u would have to be the identity operator. This one here is not the number one, it's essentially the identity operator. Now when the parameter deviates infinitesimally from zero and takes the value of epsilon, which is infinitesimally small, we would expect u to deviate infinitesimally from the identity. And basically, what you get is something which looks like this. T here is an operator. The i has been thrown in for convenience. In fact, the convenience is pretty easy to see. If you look at u dagger u, which is identity minus i epsilon t dagger times identity plus i epsilon t. And if you multiply this out, you will see that what you are going to get at least up to order epsilon is the following identity plus i epsilon t minus t dagger of course higher order terms might be there but since you have not written out higher order terms in the expression for you you have no right to actually discuss what this is right now as we will see later there are some nice group theoretical properties which tell us that you can actually talk about the higher order terms as well. But right now, we are just keeping ourselves to first order in epsilon. This has to agree with the identity up to first order in epsilon. And this immediately tells me that the operator T has to be a Hermitian operator. So notice that whenever we have a symmetry transformation which is infinitesimally close to the identity, you automatically get a corresponding Hermitian operator T in the play and Hermitian operators correspond to observables. In fact, most physically important observables arise in this particular manner. 